Washington. Uh, to start off here, we'd like to welcome you to this year's event, the new innovative format. Uh, before we kick off the event, there are four administrative announcements to kind of quickly go through. You should be seeing those there in front of you on the screen. The first is that copies of all the briefs are posted on the website, and you see the address there in front of you. Secondly, at the end of the brief, we will go through a question and answer, question and answer session, some discussion there about those. Um, but in, in the end, we'll go through some of the questions and answer questions we get today. All questions will be answered um, and sent back to you. Third, the recording for each brief, um, as well as the responses to questions submitted during the webinar, will be posted on our website. And fourth, upon exiting today's webinar, you will be prompted to do a brief questionnaire. Please take time to provide feedback regarding the issues event. Uh, the webinar will start here shortly. And to start off with, we're going to have a video clip from Skipper Branch, the CO here at NAFAC Washington, NAFAC Washington, who unfortunately could not be with us today. Following his um, video clip, it will come back to me, and we'll walk through, through the rest of the brief. Thank you. So please stand by while we switch to the video from Catherine Branch.
All this is Captain Oxdice back here again. As we've seen in the video from Captain Branch, she'd like to welcome you all to the briefing today. Um, as we move to the next round of slides, the skipper covered you know, our lead civilians here um, in the command. However, what I'll walk through now is from the field, our leadership that sits in the public works departments as well as in our um, integrated product teams. Here in NAPAC, Washington, we have two integrated product teams who both sit here in the Washington, D.C. area in Building 212 in the Washington Navy Yard. The first one is headed up by Commander Matt, Commander Select, Matt Reithmiller. Uh, typically, uh, IPT Blue looks over the installations of Annapolis, South Potomac, Pax River, as well as Andrews. IPT Gold, which is headed by Commander Select, James Cho, um, again provides these type of services for construction, uh, asset management planning, and some environmental for the Bethesda, JBAB, Quantico, and Washington areas. At each one of our install, the Navy installations in this area, we have a public works officer in charge of the public works department. For instance, at PWD at Annapolis in the Naval Academy, we have Captain Scott Bernardis, who acts as the public works officer for the uh, PWD Annapolis, which covers the academy area, as well as the NSA Annapolis, and some of the other smaller outlying, er outlying areas. Commander Select Jeff Branshaw is in charge of PWD Potomac, which includes the Dahlgren as well as the Indian Head installations. Uh, Commander Jim Watts is at PWD Pax River, which also includes Webster Field. And Lieutenant Commander Mike Singleton, who is scheduled to arrive next month, will be at our new Roink um, Andrews base. Um, and then at Bethesda, we have Commander Burr Vogel, at PWD JBAB, and JBAB is Joint Bowling Anacostia, uh, Joint Bowling Anacostia Base. And then there is also look to Commander Select um, McLemore, who is over the PWD Washington, and that includes the Washington Navy Yard, um, Naval Observatory, the Arlington Service Center, the um, a base in Suitland as well as um, Carter Rock installation. And then down at Quantico, we have another resident officer in charge of construction, and that is led by Lieutenant Commander Julie Myers. Now, as we move from in our personnel over to our goals, the first one we'll talk about is our design build. We, previous, in previous years, we've had a goal of 75% of our projects to, go, to be a design build project, with 25% being design bid build. In 2000, in FY13, we're going to modify that to go to a 60% design build mod goal with 40% of those projects going to design bid build. You can also see there for FY11 and FY12 what our actual end state was for design build of each of our projects. So in FY11, we were 80%. FY12, we had come down to 67%. So you can see we're going a little bit more toward the design bid build process. And in FY13, we will try to go to 40 or 60% for DB and 40% design bid build. Zero, um, safety accidents, proactive approach to accountability is, bottom line is, as Skipper Brand said earlier, is basically reducing and eliminating safety hazards concerns to eliminate mishaps and cut down on lost time and to also make ourselves more accountable to our employees and to our contractors out there. Additionally, we're going to have a 0% unplanned cost and schedule growth, meaning that we are setting ourselves up for our execution goals to reduce cost and schedule growth to the maximum amount possible, looking to get that to zero. So with that, we'll be looking for, you know, um, and we'll talk through construction data on the following slides. We'll be looking to install our FF&E, which is uh, fixtures, furniture, and equipment, using a turnkey approach. And for lead, for lead, we're going. Our tar target goal is lead silver, um, not lead gold. So we have 10 projects that are certified in the last 10 years. All of our projects have our new construction has a lead silver requirement within them. We'll also be looking to implement low impact development on all of our on all of our military construction projects. And you can see there from FY11 and FY12 what we attained. And finally. 
will we have a goal of meeting or exceeding all of our DOD small business goals, which we will go through in the following slides to talk to what our goal, what we obtained in the last few years, and a little discussion on what our goals are in the future. Talk and safety. And you see here on the slide in front of you, you can see some of the history here under NAPAC Washington of what we had with our contractors. You can see in FY11, we had a bump up of safety incidents. Workload was heavier, so we had some safety incidents bump up. However, in FY12, we seem to have had a very good handle on that, and that has been reduced quite a bit. And as you can see there, year to date, we are down to about a third of the DART rate from previous year, as well as the DART mishap count is down about three quarters to, compared to what was in the past with no fatalities. So for our contractors out there, that is, they're doing an excellent job of reducing that here in FY12. However, if that's anything greater than zero, there's still work to be done. So for FY13, we have established a DART rate of 1.1, which is still reducing down from previous years. And for mishap count, we're looking at taking whatever we had from the previous year, so however FY12 finishes, hopefully at 11, then we will reduce that by 3%, and that will be our goal for the future, or FY13. For fatality count, of course, that goal is always zero, and that is where we will go into FY13. Cost and schedule growth, um, you can see there in front of you is for FY11, 12, and FY10, 11, and 12, what our actuals were for each year, uh, as well as year to date. Going into FY13, we, of course, have a goal of reducing that to zero. Uh, you can see from previous years that we have done a pretty good job of cost growth of reducing it, as well as schedule. Small business goals. We led to this when we were talking about our goals earlier about how we, are, how we have done and what our plan is. As you can see, again, for 10, 11, and 12, you see where we are from the previous years and how we're tracking for FY12. Uh, right now, we are tracking at or above all of our goals for FY12. We expect that to continue here as we wrap up the fiscal year, in fact, to improve our numbers a little bit. And as we go into FY13, which unfortunately I don't have them here with us since they have not been released by DOD yet, however, I will expect that the goals for FY13 will be similar to our goals for FY12, our targets for FY12. Again, we will look, be looking in FY13 to exceed those to the maximum extent possible to create more work for our small businesses out there. Um, but overall, we're doing a pretty good job of meeting or exceeding all of our small business goals. Volume of business. While I won't go through this slide entirely because we will touch on many of these numbers in later slides, you can see there in front of you that from FY11 and 12, you can compare across the years in each one of these what we call our business lines, from capital improvements to public works to environmental and down to asset management, you can see how our workload and business volume here at NAPAC at Washington has increased or decreased or stayed relatively flat in most cases from FY11 and 12 and into our expectations for FY13. Many cases you'll see comparing FY12 to FY13 that our volume of business is pretty much level between the two years. Now we'll talk through some of the acquisition approaches that we're looking at here for Na at NAFAC Washington. First one is full and open competition. You know, many projects, if we put them on the street, we will be opening those up for any contractors that have the right skill set to place bids upon those. We will also have projects that we are going to set aside specifically for our small businesses to target those small business goals that we talked about earlier. We have several multiple war construction contracts in place. Some of those are set aside for our small businesses, and they have been pre, um, um, I don't want to use the word pre-selected, but they have, you know, in an open competition, have been selected for these MACs. And then we also have MACs for the full and open, full and open that are for the, some of the larger projects. We also have some indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity A&E contracts. Those are the guys that we lean on to do many of the designs, 1391 development, and some studies. We also have IDIQ contracts in place for some construction activities, specifically those ones you see in front of you being paving, roofing, and painting. Then we have some facility support service contracts. These cover a broad spectrum of issues that provide service to our installation tenants, 
ranging from vehicle rentals, vehicle maintenance, maintenance of our facilities, custodial, grounds, pest, etc. And of those, there's also two or three boss contracts that are under the FSC world here in the capital region. And finally, we'll talk about is job order contracts. Uh, these contracts typically target for the smaller projects themselves, and we have mini max at some of the installations out there, as well as a regional job contract that is being awarded in the not too distant future. Talking a bit of design and acquisition planning. Built upon our previous slide, we talked about you know what acquisition strategy do we use? The first one in looking at strategic approach is our design strategies depend depend on in-house capacity for our uh, design development. And then we look at which contract vehicle is most appropriate for that particular project. You know, typically projects over $30 million we're going to be looking for our standalone full and open. We're looking for our contractors that have great relevant experience in those particular projects to come in and provide proposals. For less than $30 million, we will look a little bit more to some of our MAC um, applications or in some cases still a full and open depending upon the project. And then when we get below $15 million is where we're going to start looking more and targeting a little bit more to our small business community using either small business set-asides or our MAC vehicles specifically set aside for the small business. Um, our planning comes more tactical when the program gets authorized, meaning once we get authorization saying here is how big your program is going to be, here's, how much, here's the projects you get, and here's how much money you're going to have for those, then we'll start working on um, some of the details you see there in front of you and narrowing that down to which project with the design build, design bid build, which contract vehicle um, that we're going to get to. Some of the variances there is the design build is when upfront uh, design required to be you know, if a client desires, you know, if a client has desire there, we may go one way or the other based on the client's desires of design bid or design bid build. You know, some of the per permitting requirements may dictate which avenue we go between design build and design bid build. Also, there's also variations in the acquisition strategies. You know, small business goals, available capacity. You know, we have goals to meet established upon us by DOD, so we will be looking for projects that we can use to meet those goals. MAC capacity and the scope. Some projects are well suited for using the after the MAC vehicles, while some of those are not. Uh, another one at the bottom, without reading through all of them, is the timing of multiple solicitations. First off, um, back on the slide, volume of business, we had a lot of numbers listed there under the different business lines, and I said we would walk through those numbers later. The first one of these we'll walk through is the capital improvements business line. Under there, there's three product lines. I won't read those. I suspect many of you have been in these webinars over the last week and have seen those definitions before. However, for in our capital improvements business line, we're looking at a design in place for FY13 of about $720 million, which is very similar to what we have for 12. And then we have a work in place equaling about $758 million. And then some miscellaneous tech services that we will be going out to contract support in the $10 million. So bottom line on capital improvements, our bottom of business for FY13 is expected to be about $1.5 billion. The next slides, we'll talk through a little bit more details. So for this slide in front of you now, the FY13 MILCOM program is we have 10 projects in FY13, depending upon the signing of the authorization and the appropriation bills, um, and that equal about $244 million. As you can see in front of you, we, right now we are tracking 70% of those to be at the design build and 30% DBB. That is slightly ahead of our goals that we'd established at one time. Our acquisition strategies, about 40% of those are going to be standalone. 40% are targeted for the small business MAC, and 20 or 20% are targeted to our large MAC. And then the last the last line there, you can see kind of where those are allocated to. Three of those are located at Bethesda, three at Quantico and then one each at Annapolis, Dahlgren, Indian Head, and one at JBAP. The slide you have now in front of you is a listing of those 10 projects. Without going into the details, you can see there the project name itself, ranging from a fitness center down to a child development center, ranging on down to a weapons training battalion mess hall at Quantico. The design type gives a listing of what design build or design bid build we have targeted that we are executing for that project as well as the plan con uh, contract method, whether it's a MAC or 
a standalone construction contract, which is the SACC. Each one of those projects is the preliminary planned amount. Keep in mind that that is not finalized until the appropriation and, and appropriation and authorization bills are signed by Congress um, for FY13. And then we have listed out there when we estimate uh, the RFP will go on the street for each one of those projects. In front of you now, you have a listing of projects that are a re not a re reverse, a repair project for those installations. While there is many, many, many repair projects expected at each of the installations, for the brief today, we wanted to give a short listing at least of some of the more major projects that we potentially may see, all depending on how the budgets fall, uh, budgets are approved for FY13. As you can see there, there are several larger projects we believe may happen at, at Annapolis. Um, there's also a Navy Lodge expansion at Bethesda that may come our way, depending upon the budgets, as well as three to four projects at Quantico, two of those related to some dam repairs. And then finally down at the end with Indian Head, there's four projects there from the medical clinic renovation to a project at the Chesapeake Beach NRL, um, which that says Indian Head, but I think that should say um, Annapolis. And then on the right-hand side for estimated amount, that gives you kind of what we believe the projects are going to be. Sorry, that's a big spectrum. However, with that, without the budgets being in place, um, we want to just give you a, a brief idea of how large those might be. Most of these all be, are below five million, maybe three, maybe two, and then um, the ones above five, you know, could be ten or twelve. However, we're still waiting for the final budgets before we can release any of those numbers. Next business line we'll talk through very briefly here is the Public Works, which has four product lines you see there in front of you. Uh, the volume of business for the Public Works business line is total about 76, 75.6 million, with the bulk of that resting in the FSC contracts and some utility projects. In front of you now, you have a slide which lists um, 10, I think it's 10 contracts that we're looking to execute in the FY13 for the FSC world. You can see two or three of those are related to bus operations or school buses and shuttle buses in the um, National Capital Region area. There's also a couple of janitorial projects, specifically the one at, Beth at Bethesda, as well as some um, a large boss contract at Pax River, which we re um, re-solicited and awarded in FY13. For utility infrastructure repair projects, you have in front of you there a listing, not inclusive of everything. This is the ones that we have this the best feel for, of what we believe we're going to be have on the street in FY13 for award. Uh, you can see there on the right hand side the list, or the left hand side, I'm sorry, the project name, which I won't do through all those, but that gives you a listing of what those projects are, as well as the location for which they are located. And again, the estimated amount whether it's above or below $1 million to kind of give you a gen generic idea of the breadth and scope based on cost. Next slide. For the Public Works Energy Program, um, the projects we all listed earlier were ones where we will be using money obtained through appropriated amounts or rate amounts to pay for. These projects listed here are contract vehicles, just to kind of get an idea. These are financed energy projects. You know, we have the ESPC contracts, which we have one of those ongoing at Webster Field. And then we also have the utility energy savings co contracts, and you see a few of those listed up there. Um, the interesting thing about these projects is they are paid for via their savings and their, how they're financed. Um, and some of these are underway. Unfortunately, I don't know, we don't have a good feel yet for how much of this will be ongoing in FY13. However, Dave Capazzoli listed down there below as well as that website is a good source of information that can um, provide info on where we're at with these projects and what is planned for the future. Next slide. Next business line we'll move into is environmental. Two product lines are environmental, again, environmental quality and environmental restoration. Um, the volume of business and environmental is 45. 45 million dollars and it's a pretty even spread between the quality type work and the restoration work. 
two contract vehicles that we're going to be looking to award in FY13 for an environmental, and these are both regional environmental contracts, is we have an, an a and &E services type contract that is on the street today and proposals have been received. However, we're looking to award that in FY, the second quarter FY13. And then another project for environmental services which is going to be a multiple ward construction, uh, multiple ward contract, which the proposals are due to go out here in the next month or two. So please be watching the FedBiz Ops and the other places for new business for when those come out. Again, we'll be looking to award that one in FY13 second quarter. A couple of POCs here within NAFAC Washington that are our smart guys on these are listed there below with Bob Williams, Paula Gilbertson, and Kevin Montgomery. The final business line we'll walk through today is the asset management business line. Um, and you can see here in front of me, that kind of goes through what they do. Typically, business, the asset management, the planning guys are looking at, you know, shore infrastructure plans, specialized studies, encroachment studies, um, as well as help us prepare 1391 documentation and various other just planning documents to be simple about it. While we don't have any large contract vehicles planned for this year, because we have two contract vehicles that were awarded in recent years that um, much of the planning work will go into um, for the FY13. So with that, kind of talk through some contact information. Here at NAFAC Washington, two, con two names to give you for contact is Allison Harvich, who's one of our senior 1102s or contract officers here in the command. She's your best point of contact for information related to general contracting issues. If it's a small business contracting question or just looking for information, Ali Hernandez in the number listed up there is your best point of contact. And also there is the NAFAC public portal that you see the link on that you can go to and get current information on from on NAFAC, its organizations, its policies, its mission, as well as some business opportunities. Now to kind of summarize how we walk through here, um, and we'll also kind of reiterate some of what Captain Branch talked about early on, is here in NAFAC, Washington, in the National Capital Region, there's a lot of opportunities to get for design, construction, and our public works business line, as well as planning and environmental. As we walk through in the previous slides, you can see there's several military construction projects, special repair projects, as well as on our facilities out there, as well as our utility infrastructure, and there's several environmental, and there will be um, more repair projects than what you see there as we go through. As we move through the FY13, as always, we're always looking for new innovative ways to do business. So we're looking at acquisition reform questions. We're looking at ways to do business differently from design build. Uh, we're looking at innovative approaches that we see from our A&E contractors as they are developing our um, 1391s, RFPs, and our designs for our projects. Safety, go back and iterate some of the earlier slides, is we have goals established out there to, ma to have a goal system maintained. However, we're always looking at, at zeroing out any safety mishaps, fatalities, and everything the best that we can. So while we do have goals established earlier, realistically to our employees and contractors, a zero is the best answer and what we shall be striving to. Quality, we're looking for our contractors to always be looking to provide the utmost quality to our Navy, Navy, Marine Corps, and other service clients here in the National Capital Region. Performance and timeliness. You know, our clients out there in the Navy and Marine Corps commands, as well as other services, have missions to meet, and therefore we're always very conscious of the fact that we need to provide these projects, services, planning documents, environmental documents, all on time and as quick as possible. With that, we're looking at quality products, complete and on time from our contractors. Finally, we look forward to working with you in the next, our industry partners here in the next F, next year, FY13 and beyond, uh, as we look to provide support for our supported commanders at the Navy and Marine Corps installations, as well as the other services scattered in the National Capital Region. With that, we're going to walk through some questions that we have obtained during this process, uh, my briefing, which there has been many rolling in, so thank you very much for those information. I actually see some familiar names up there. So what we will do is I have a team around the table here with me this morning, which you have not been able to see on the screen. 
as well I've been talking they have been receiving these questions and um, documenting some answers for us while we will not be able to go through every question this morning and answer those we will go through several and we will in the end go through and answer all questions and return those answers back to you um, if I forget to say it or later we will keep this link open for 15 or 20 minutes after we finish, so you will not be seeing anything video or audio, but we will have the link open so that you can continue to answer or submit any questions that you may think of as I answer these and for the next 15 or so minutes after we stop if something comes up. So with that, uh, we're going to gather a couple of questions and go ahead and get started. Okay, the first question I have is related to DIP, which is design in place distribution between in-house and our architect and engineer firms. Um, we need to verify that the distribution, which we'll post later. Okay, so bottom line is we will be looking to get that answer to you and we will um, forward out some of that distribution into our formal answer for your question. Second question I have is for the 10 mil cons you listed on the previous slide, is that all inclusive? At this time, that is all inclusive for us. So unless there is some ads, congressional ads as the FY13 appropriation bill and, uh, and um, authority bill are going through the system and approval, unless one is added at that time, this list is all inclusive for us. So there will be 10 mil cons for FY13 in the national capital region. Next question is, do we have an acquisition strategy and RFP release date for SRM? Maybe working capital funds, which, and which one of those are design build versus design bid build? With regard to the RFP release, um, due to the expected um, CRA and uncertainty when all the appropriation bills and when we will have authority to actually begin spending money in advertising, we can't really release when we think those RFPs are going to be on the street. We would be somewhat guessing at this point and we would not want to lead you astray with those dates. So until we get more um, definition on the appropriation authorization bills, we will not be able to release that. And that is, a, and we will publish in the questions, so you can see on the website, which one of those are design build and design bid build. And keep in mind, the list we showed up there for SRM, that was just a small list of some of the larger ones that we think have a higher probability as a whole of getting um, to the approval process. Okay. All right, the next question is, is the EV MAC that we showed on the previous slides going to be set aside for small business or unrestricted? The answer, is going to, the answer is it is set aside for the um, SDV OSB, which is um, small dis disabled vets, veteran owned small business. Okay. We have more questions? Except for the other. Okay. All right. Oh, there's some more. All right. Next question is Does NAPAC Washington plan to issue another IDIQ for planning next year? The answer here is uh, another IDIQ is not in the short-term plan, but it is possible. Every year we do a workload projection to determine our needs for contracting, contracting vehicles across the enterprise. This year we had a quite a bit of demand from the outside of the FEC, so it's possible that we may have a greater need within the land OR and we'll look to close at that in the first quarter of FY13. Next question I have is, does NAFAC Washington, um, any enhanced use leasing opportunities coming up? Uh, the answer here is NAFAC Washington is currently working with developers on two EULs. A request for qualifications will be issued for each within the next few months. All right, my next question here is, what is NAFAC Washington's lead goal policy as related to the FY12 National Defense Authorization Act? Um, well, they typed up me a good answer for this one long. And so please bear with me as they typed this in while we were talking earlier. 
For FY12 and beyond mill cons, NAPAC Washington has included and will continue to include the following statement of RFPs. Offer shall not propose lead gold or lead platinum certifications to this requirement. If proposed, it shall render the proposal ineligible for award. In other words, NAPAC Washington will not seek anything more than lead silver certification in either its FY12 and beyond Milcom projects until further notice from Congress. Even if the contractors offer lead gold or lead platinum certification, the lead gold or, lead or platinum certification will not be pursued or accepted by NAPAC Washington and therefore refused at the, by the offering, refused to the offering contractor. Only lead silver certification will be accepted. All right, a little bit more on that is for FY11 and prior MILCON projects, NAPAC Washington recognizes that lead gold or higher priority was stated in the FY12 NDAA or higher policy as stated in FY12 NDAA is not advertised. However, due to the highly political sensitivity of this issue, it is recommended that contractors again contact NAPAC Washington as soon as possible for guidance prior to pursuing or applying for lead gold or platinum certifications. All right, let's see. All right, next question I have is we understand that NAFAC is evolving or returning to, from one perspective, transitioning much of their design and engineering from the heavy reliance on the use of architects and engineer community to performing much of their work by an in-house design model. What is the basis for this strategy? Is it real? And how can we assist if this is a real directive? All right. For the answer, NAFAC is currently adjusting the way they engage with the A&E community from a heavily dependent mo mode and model used over the past decade that to that one of relying on the outside con contracting community to perform their design build work and design bid build work to a model that capitalizes on our core competencies for engineering. Historically, NAFAC has been viewed as having this expertise. However, during very favorable economic times, including the delivery of projects associated with BRAC, the balance of the workload shifted more to dependency on our a &E firms. By balancing shifting a greater amount of the work to be performed by our in-house expertise, we will be able to maintain staffing levels in order to retain the quality of expertise we have. Over the past several years, NAFAC has benefited from the influence of many professionals from the private sector and is excited about the opportunities to pres this presents for our customers and the delivery of our products and services. The initial eff efforts associated with this strategy should not have a significant impact on the AE community because the in-house design effort will be primarily for RFP development on MILCOM projects and for the smaller design bid build projects. NAFAT will continue to rely upon the a &E community to supplement our staffing and expertise needs, which is not currently complete. Okay. All right, our next question is, for the MILCON listed on the MAX, are the MAX already established? The answer is yes. We have both a large MAC and a small MAC in place. Both are midway through their five-year performance periods. All right, next question I have is, lately it seems like all projects using the best value source selections acquisition method are being awarded to the offer with the lowest price and not necessarily to the offer with the best technical solution. If this is the case, why does NAFAC even bother with using DDSS as an acquisition method? All right. Um, while it may sometimes seem that NAFAC makes awards based simply on the lowest cost, we can assure you that we are adhering to the requirements of the DDSS process as set forth in the FAR. And concerning all technical evaluation factors as well as the cost, we're making these award determinations. The BVSS process allows the flexibility to make trade-offs between cost and technical in order to determine the best value to the government. While it is true that NAFAC Washington often selects the lowest cost proposal as the best value, that is not always the case. We thoroughly evaluate the technical portion of the proposals for each acquisition and then compare the results to the technical evaluation with the cost proposals to determine which combination 
of technical and cost represents the best value to the government. All right. All right, next question I'm going to read from the screen. Um, will or can NAFAC Washington use IDIQ contract vehicles from NAFAC Atlanta or Mid-Atlantic to expand acquisition capabilities to execute task orders within NDW? The answer is yes. An example of that is the CH2MM, CH2M Hill contract, Clark Nexon, and the, for energy and commissioning. Right. We got some more questions coming to me. People are scribbling furiously answering those. All right, for our next question, it is for EV services, Mac, does the contract cover EV restoration? Their answer is no. The restoration is covered by the remedial action contract and will not be included in this new Mac. Okay. I think we have one more question we'll try and answer here this morning. But the question I have is, will there be any new A&E IDIQ for 13 slash 14? The answer is yes. We're looking to put in place a civil slash structural A&E IDIQ. We're also looking to put in place a new mechanical, electrical, and plumbing with commissioning. IDIQ, as well as a multidiscipline architect and engineer services IDIQ, as well as a um, 1391 development IDIQ, which is okay. All right. Um, so for this morning, that is the questions we're going to take this morning to answer. Um, we will be answering all the questions that you are submitting. Um, to us this afternoon. Um, as I stated earlier, once we finish here, we will maintain the site open for another 15 or 20 minutes to keep obtaining your answers. While some of these we did not answer this morning, it was ones that we did not feel we could provide you a satisfactory answer on the spot very quickly. Um, some of these we did, um, but we do not want to give you an incorrect answer, so we will be taking those to gather the answers and post those on the website. Sorry about that. We accidentally um, went off the line there for a few minutes. So in front of you now, you should see the slide titled End of Webinar. One, I want to thank you for participating here today and some great questions. And I see many, many more that have come in that are all really good questions that we will get you answers for. Um, as you exit this morning or before you exit, please remember to visit the website you see there in front of you, as well as conduct the survey that we, we mentioned to you earlier when you exit. Um, all the questions and answers received today will be posted on our public website that you see on the slide there. And today's webinar was recorded. This recording will be posted on the, uh, the website also soon also. So with that, I want to thank you again for participating this morning or this afternoon. And thank you all for coming.